It's an average weekend for a small town farming family. Well, I would describe them as very typical farming family. You have a mom, a dad, a brother and a sister, and a dog. The night creeps on, and eventually everyone is in bed. At least, almost everyone is. But what happens to these people? No one in their community is prepared for. When we arrived at the scene, it had been investigated by the RCMP, and they would have gone through it with a fine tooth comb. Given the proper environment and accelerant, there is the possibility that the human body can be burned where there is no identifiable remains. This has certainly been taken to another level. This is being looked at more than just a fire. But who would want them dead? Was it a stranger or one of their own? And why now? Castor, Alberta is a small town, an hour and a half east of Red Deer. It takes up just over two and a half square kilometers. The town is incorporated in 1910, growing over time to a population of nearly 1,000 people. The name Castor is actually taken from the French and Latin word for beaver. The town takes pride in its namesake, making a five-foot-tall statue of a beaver named Patty their mascot. Their love for beavers doesn't end with a mascot. Beaver imagery can be found all over the small town, from other statues to the welcome sign to official imagery for the town. Ducks and geese travel through the area when it comes time for their migration, and the area contains many stopping points for the birds. The excess of waterfowl makes Castor a great destination for hunters during the migration season. Many members of the Castor community are avid hunters themselves. But it's not just the hunting that drives people to Castor. In the summertime, tourists travel to the area to relax and enjoy the Lake Light Creek on the northeast of the town. Gordon and Sandy Klaus raise their family on a farm in Castor. The two are high school sweethearts who get married in April of 1972. They welcome their first daughter, Lisa, in the spring of 1971 and spend the next few years living and working on Gordon's parents' farm. A couple of years later, the couple is blessed with a second daughter, Monica. But soon after Monica's birth, tragedy strikes the family. A farming accident takes the life of their first daughter on Thanksgiving Day, 1973. Soon after, the couple take Monica and move to a farm of their very own. Two years later, their son Jason is born and their family is complete. Jason and Monica grow up on the family farm. Together with their parents, they all share a love for hunting and fishing.
I would describe them as very typical farming family. You have a mom, a dad, a brother and a sister, and a dog. I would say that they're hardworking. Days don't mean anything. Hours don't mean anything to these people. They work when the work needs to be done. The family keeps things fun, especially Gordon, who's known for being a prankster and who loves a good laugh. Daughter Monica gets a job managing the HR department of an office in Stettler and moves there to be closer to her work. Though Monica lives in another town, it is less than an hour away from Castor. She makes a point of coming home most weekends to help out where she can around the farm. Jason sticks much closer to home, moving into a trailer on another part of the property. He is only a three minute drive from his parents' home. But even the short distance is enough to afford him some level of privacy from the rest of his family. Even after his move, Jason continues to work for his family on the farm. When not working, he often drives to his parents' home to have his laundry done or have a home-cooked meal. But Jason would rather be spending his time elsewhere than working on the farm. No matter how busy they get with farming and family life, Gordon and Sandy take time to give back to the community. Community is incredibly important to them. They are members of the Kinsmen and the Kinnets, respectively organizations that aim to give aid where they can, often by sponsoring events and community service projects. They participate in the community as well as anybody else. I could see Mr. Klaus Sr. I could see him, you know, going into town, to have coffee with other farmers during the winter when things were slow around the farm. In early December of 2013, Gordon is recovering from surgery. After suffering from heart problems, he reaches a point of needing a stent put in. The purpose of a stent is to open up the coronary artery so it produces proper blood flow and oxygenation to your vital organs. While recovering from the operation, Gordon is left feeling weak. While not completely incapacitated, he's less capable of getting all of his work done around the farm, leaving more to fall on his family. On Saturday, December 7th, 2013, Monica comes home to the farm for the weekend, hoping to help carry the extra weight while her father recovers from surgery. Jason is known for sleeping when the rest of the family is working and not taking the farm as seriously as the rest of them. Monica and his mom had done some cleaning and cooking um, when him and his dad had come in from chores. I believe that Monica and his mom then were putting up a new Christmas tree or a Christmas tree with new lights. Even with Gordon having a hard time post-surgery, the family has a reason to be cheery for the holidays now that he's in recovery. The whole family has dinner together, ending with some of Sandy's lemon meringue pie for dessert. As the night goes on, the family time continues and they watch a curling match together on TV. Before anyone turns in for the night, Jason leaves to go to his trailer. He had gone home because he had a possibility that some of his pipes would freeze in his trailer because it was cold. Jason calls his father about the night's weather forecast. His dad is a weather watcher. So he called his dad and said, what, what's it looking like for tonight? Are we getting too cold? Do I need to increase heat on this, uh, on, on his pipes, stuff like that? As it gets later in the evening, Gordon, Sandy, and Monica turn in for the night. But as they sleep, an unexpected visitor moves about the house. And they have plans for everyone inside. 
but why would anyone want to harm the Klaus family? Castor is a small town in the province of Alberta, Canada. Described as an oasis on the prairie, its tree-lined streets and rural family values make this picturesque town ideal for raising a family. Serving the large agricultural area that surrounds it, Castor has also found itself a home base of sorts for many persons and service companies employed in the oil and gas industry. The area is a stomping ground for waterfowl, and rolling landscapes give the region fantastic hunting. Hunting enjoyed by people like the Klaus family, local farmers, and valued community members. Parents Gordon and Sandy, along with daughter Monica, have retired to bed for the night, unaware that someone has entered the family home to set the house ablaze while the family are sleeping inside. The house was completely consumed when the fire department arrived. Again, you know, small town. You know, maybe it took them longer to get there than the average fire department. But those fire departments are quite quick on the draw these days. They're, they're not like years ago where people had, they're fast and they're efficient and they're quick. And, Sometimes they get to the rural fires almost as fast as the city fire department gets there, so. The firefighters answer the call as quickly as they can, but by the time they arrive, the house is already engulfed in flames. They decide that the farm is beyond saving and that it would be for the best to just let the fire burn itself out, as any water they throw on it could ruin any potential evidence that may be on the scene. One of the reasons they won't put a lot of water on a fire is because the subsequent fire investigation it is hindered by ice. So if they fill it all up with water, then at the end of the day, then that building may have to be hoarded in, everything thawed out, the water pumped out, so investigation can follow. Well, house fires occur frequently, and uh, every one of them is treated as a potential crime scene until otherwise determined. They essentially, you know, may contain evidence that needs to be preserved in the event a crime did take place, even though at the time it's, it's completely unknown and it may have been uh, entirely accidental. One of the first firefighters on the scene is close with the family and is able to call Jason, the family's eldest son, who lives nearby. Upon hearing the news, Jason races to the farm. He reaches the house while it's still in flames, and he has to be held back to keep from running inside. The RCMP begin investigating the fire right away. This is being looked at more than just a fire, because in most cases, law enforcement are not interested in every fire that takes place in their area. They only become interested in the fire when the circumstances and or the evidence surrounding the fire becomes suspicious or unexplained by the fire department. What happens there is the fire department has identified something or suspects something has taken place or are unable to answer some of the questions and tick off some of the boxes on their investigation now they consider it to be maybe suspicious. At that point in time, they contact the RCMP if they're not already on scene, and they say, you know what, we got a problem here. Suspicions rise immediately when the family dog is found dead outside the house with drops of blood and bullet casings close by her body. If in fact it was shot, then that's a huge red flag. And if it wasn't, then, you know, why did it die? Why, why is it outside the house? You know, has it been beaten? You know, what are the circumstances? Because most times an animal would run if it has the ability to run. So the fact that it's still there is also an oddity because most 
domestic animals will run, cats, dogs. Sometimes you never find them, sometimes it's a day later or an hours later when they kind of wander their way back. A gas can is discovered nearby the house, partially melted from the heat of the fire. The can is still two thirds full of gas. Most farmers use large fuel containers and service all their equipment and vehicles off that container, usually out by the shop or somewhere close to the shop. Certainly not, usually never ever next to the house. So, you know, that's a, that's a bit of a red flag. Jason is called into the RCMP detachment in Coronation, Alberta, just two days after the fire on December 10th. Well, the Klaus family is known to be very close-knit. They seem to be involved in many activities together. They certainly resided together. They were in business together. They probably socialized a lot together. So, you know, what one did, the other likely knew about. Who were their associates? What sort of business ventures, if any, were they involved in? Uh, were there any problems in that person's life that uh, may have tragically resulted in their death. There's a lot of information that a family member may be able to provide to investigators. According to Jason, on the evening before the fire, after leaving his parents' house, he drives to the Hutterite colony and then back home. Hutterites are a communal religious group that live in various closed communities across Canada known for their highly efficient and mechanized farming practices. Having immigrated to Canada after World War I, they're an important fixture in rural Canadian life. He'd gone to the Hutterite colony because a friend of his there, his wife had made some pies and he was gonna pick up some pies. In Western Canada, not unusual to have friendships at the Hutterite colony and not unusual to go there and buy pies or chickens or whatever um, they have that um, that you'd like. After getting Jason's account of the night, he gets the chance to ask any questions he might have for the RCMP. Jason brings up the possibility of missing vehicles from the farm, asks about what caused the fire or if there could have been foul play. When he doesn't get any definite answers, he brings up a deer head that was up in his parents' house as a possible motive. Jason kills this deer near Coronation back in 2007 after Sandy spots it. He often brags about being offered $10,000 and a new truck for it, but on each retelling, the value of the deer head seems to grow. Deer hunting and fishing are kind of similar. The fish gets bigger and, and longer and with the telling of every story. I don't think the deer head is any different than that. I think it was an exceptional um, mount, don't doubt about that. And, and it did win an award with uh, one of the outdoor magazines. And I think he was paid $250 or whatever for that uh, award. Jason tells the RCMP about some American hunters who were recently in the area. He believes they could have murdered his family and started the fire to get his prized deer head. The RCMP fly to Utah to check on this story and interview the hunters. The theory of their involvement is proven wrong almost immediately when their passports reveal that they've not returned to Canada since their hunting trip. People have been murdered for far less. Um, but I, I wouldn't think so. If it was that valuable, he would probably be using it as a business. He would be promoting that, that uh, mount, and it would be being shown at different events throughout certainly Canada, maybe North America, who knows. For, you know, outdoor sporting events, they would use it for promotion purposes. A sniffer dog is brought through the wreckage of the house and notices 16 points within the debris that need further investigation. My experience would tell me that they would have basically grid that entire area off and they would have gone through it literally with a fine tooth comb. Pretty much everything in that basement was out. It was an empty basement and they would have sifted through, literally sifted with a sifter through that entire basement to locate 
bone fragments, teeth, anything that wasn't destroyed in the fire. When the investigators check on the highlighted sections, they find evidence of human remains. They're also able to confirm the use of an accelerant, like gasoline, at the site. Keith Jaynes is a fire investigator with Global Forensics. He is brought in by the insurance company to investigate the probable cause of the fire. We entered a structure the first time on the 21st, and uh, on that date, we did our cursory investigation, and that generally includes pretty much the whole farm. I was walking around with Jason, and we pretty much walked around that entire farm. He explained how farming process worked, who was responsible for what, where things were. I did a recorded interview with him at that point in time, and he explained, you know, the events surrounding prior to, during, and after the fire. His demeanor is, it's fine. Would it be the way I would be reacting if it was my parents and my sister? I don't know, because I, of course, never had that happen. I would have expected more emotion, but not everybody reacts the same to emotions. The first time I interviewed him, a lot of stuff had taken place from the time of the fire to the time I interviewed him. It's possible that during the course of an investigation um, and in the days and weeks following a very serious incident, people have spoken about it so many times to investigators, to other friends, or to the media, that it can start to sound that way. So not too much should be read into that because throughout the process, these individuals end up telling their story so many times. Jason is informed that the remains of Gordon and Monica are discovered within the ashes of the building. When Sandy isn't confirmed as well, Jason becomes convinced the RCMP must be lying to him and playing some kind of mind game. Given the proper environment and accelerant, there is the possibility that the human body can be burned where there is no identifiable remains. It is the same process as a cremation. Not long after, Gordon's truck is discovered near Battle River. So the truck was owned by the farm or by um, Gordon, the dad. So he said it was full of fuel, keys in the ignition. It is not unusual for vehicles to have keys in them on farms. But still, it would not be unusual to find a fuel truck, a water truck, a grain truck, or, or even their primary source of transportation to be to have keys in them, or, or certainly in the ignition, or certainly in the truck somewhere. Talking to other members of the community, the RCMP's investigation finds inconsistencies in Jason's story. He talks about just going to a Hutterite colony, but it comes out that he actually goes to a bar on that night where he spends at least a few hours with a friend. Small towns are really well known for, you know, a lack of anonymity. The cashier or the pharmacist or the person working at the gas station probably knows who you are, knows where you live. So it's not easy to hide in a small town if you're from there. At the start of 2014, a major development changes the course of the entire investigation. Jason says he knows who killed his family. Gordon and Sandy Klaus and their children, Monica and Jason, are a farming family who love to hunt, fish, and help out the community of their small town of Castor. Sometime in the early hours of December 8th, 2013, Gordon and Sandy's house is set ablaze. Both are sleeping inside at the time, along with Monica, who is in town for the weekend to help on the farm. Jason lives in a trailer on another part of the property. One of the firefighters who are close with the family called Jason to tell him what's happened. Jason rushes over, 
but it's too late for him to do anything. The remains of Gordon and Monica are confirmed within the burned wreckage of the house, but no sign of Sandy is discovered. Jason claims to have gone only to a Hutterite colony for pie on the night of the fire, but further investigation tells the RCMP that isn't the whole truth. My second major interview with him was, um, was not expected. What had taken place was, at this point in time now, we're talking into January, the insurance company has still not had a face-to-face -face with him with respect to the loss, the actual loss of the property and the contents of the property. The insurance company calls Keith, asking if he would mind accompanying their insurance adjuster as she checks out the Klaus property. She's made uncomfortable by the possibility of a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Jason. There was another gentleman there who was driving a black pickup truck and he just said to Jason, I'm heading back to the house, I'll talk to you later. At that point in time, he says, I have something interesting to show you. And I said, oh, and he said, yes. He said, come, come with me. He said, in the basement, he said, I found evidence. So we walked towards the basement. Now, the basement still had some tarping over it and a ladder to get into the, the basement from the outside. So we went down into the basement and he said, yeah, he said, I found a tooth and I found a bullet. Keith insists that Jason should tell the RCMP, but Jason changes the subject. So at that point in time, he looked at me and said, can I ask you a question? And I said, absolutely. He said, do you believe in spirits? And of course, you know, I, I've been down this road many times with people in interviews, and I had a fair idea of exactly where that was going. And I said, absolutely, I believe in spirits. Jason tells Keith that he's been visited by the ghosts of his family members. He said uh, the first time he said they came to visit me was at the driveway. So he explained earlier in, in his previous interview that he had gotten wait, woken up at 7.30-ish to, from a friend who had called and said your mom and dad's house are on fire. And so he rushed over and was stopped. I believe he said it was his mom and his sister had come to him and said, don't worry about it. We know who did this. We, you know, don't, don't retaliate. Don't do anything, just let it be. We're fine, everything is okay, we're good. Jason goes on to explain in detail what happened, claiming the spirits have told him everything about the night of the fire. So as he's telling me, he said, the guy is in front of Monica's bedroom and he said, she's in her bed and she comes up, she, she comes up and says, wah, wah. And he said at that point in time, he shoots her. And um, he said that she didn't die right away. So he had to shoot her again. And at that point in time, he said, my dad came out of the room and boom, boom, he shot him. And then my mother came out of the living room and boom, he shot her. Then he said he took a gas can and he put gas all over the place and then he lit it up. And he said, that's what happened. Jason acts out what he claims the spirits of his family told him happened that night while Keith continues to insist that Jason go to the RCMP. I said, oh, I said, he shot them? And he said, oh yeah, he said, he shot them. I said, do you know what he used to shoot them? And he said, yeah, nine millimeter. I said, oh. So he you know, talked about the gun and stuff a little bit. And then I said, he wouldn't have happened to tell you where that gun is now or what he did with it. And he said, yeah, he said, it is in the river 
with my troubles. And I said, oh, and he said, yeah. And so then he talked about the river, and then he talked about the truck that was missing from the farm, was found by the river. After leaving the Klaus property, Keith knows he needs to inform the RCMP about everything they heard. We just pulled over on the road. I gave her a notepad. I said, you just write down everything that comes to your mind right now. I did the same thing. We met with investigators a short time later in a neighboring town and basically gave her statements as to what Jason had told us during that period of time. It's important for investigators to locate and speak with witnesses as soon as possible after an occurrence. Uh, information that they may be able to provide has a certain value which could degrade the longer it's left for them to think about. Their, their memories are often contaminated or tainted by information they obtain from other sources uh, and what they actually saw versus what they heard about often become conflated. So the sooner the investigators can speak with a witness, the better. Asking a person to provide their account of the events in their own words from start to finish is a useful tool. Often what they leave out is more telling than what they add into the statement. Keith isn't the only person with whom Jason talks about seeing spirits. Jason sets up a meeting with Brady Flett, Monica's boss. Brady has been helping out since Monica's death, keeping her trailer maintained and even giving Jason some money. Jason brings up spirits to Brady, claiming he knows exactly who killed Monica. But he can't go to the RCMP because he's worried he'll get blamed. Before the meeting ends, Jason asks Brady for more money. But Brady buys time by saying he'll need to talk to his partners first. When their meeting ends, Brady goes right to his office and types up everything Jason's just told him. He sends all of this information to the RCMP. In early 2014, the RCMP speak to Jason again. This time, it's clear that he's become a suspect in his family's death. When someone brings in something like a, a spirit, you know, or almost like a third party, but not in the legal sense of a third party information, but almost like a third party, they're bringing in an exterior identity. And in this case, an aunt, a mother, and a sister. And they're telling the story. So it's like he's standing back and allowing the spirits to tell the story to whoever wants to listen to it. But he has nothing to do with it. He's just a medium between the spirit and the receiver of the information. Is Jason sublimating his own guilt with stories from beyond the grave? Jason's friend, Josh Frank, is brought in to talk to the RCMP when it comes out that the two of them were together on the night of the fire. Josh agrees to a polygraph test despite his lawyer's hesitancy. When questioned about the night of the fire, the test reveals that Josh is being truthful about his lack of involvement. So lie detector tests actually aren't admissible in court proceedings at all. What they are useful for is by police as an investigatory tool to either exclude suspects or to determine who they may want to look into further. By the spring of 2014, Brady comes around on the idea of helping Jason with some money and makes an introduction that can change everything for him. The Kloss family home is set ablaze in the middle of the night, with Gordon, Sandy, and their daughter Monica all inside. Jason is Gordon and Sandy's son and lives in a trailer on another part of their property. He's interviewed multiple times by the RCMP as well as by other investigators. Each time he brings up increasingly specific questions and theories as to what could have happened to his family. In the month after the fire, Jason starts telling various people that he knows exactly what happened to his family because their spirits have been visiting him. 
After reports of the story make it to the RCMP, they investigate Jason as a suspect. On April 1st, 2014, Brady introduces Jason to someone looking to pay to store items on Jason's farm. It's made clear to Jason that this arrangement is one to be kept off the books. Jason is warned by multiple people in his life that his new friends could be undercover police, but Jason insists that he isn't worried. As Jason and his new friend get closer, Jason is brought along on all kinds of jobs. They collect on loans, repossess vehicles, and even go as far as assaulting a woman, an event that ends with Jason asking why they don't just kill her. On June 2nd, 2014, Jason confides in his new friend that he had some involvement in the death of his family. When asked why, he reveals that he wanted to pay some bills and have some cash to throw around, concluding that, I really don't know what the hell I was thinking. He later says that he only planned the murders. It was his friend Josh who acted as the gunman. Little does Jason know that ever since Brady introduced him to his new friend, he's been the target of a Mr. Big Sting operation. There are many investigational techniques that police will use to look into a potential suspect. Undercover operations are one of those techniques, and one of them that we often hear about are Mr. Big Stings. Mr. Big operations involve an undercover officer um, basically posing as a member of some sort of criminal organization. Essentially, the undercover investigators are staging a bunch of fake crimes, and they're getting the suspect, uh, the target, to take part in those fake crimes. No actual crimes are committed, but the target feels they are taking part in these criminal activities. And luring the accused person into uh, a conspiracy, uh, getting them to open up about uh, past crimes that they've been involved with. In order to sort of advance through that organization, and become a trustworthy member of that criminal organization, they're asked to reveal what types of crimes they may have committed in the past. And, you know, the more serious the crime, the more likely they're going to be accepted into the organization. The piece of information that would likely be asked for would be information related to the homicide that investigators are looking into. These are very controversial tactics. They're actually banned in the UK and the US. Um, in Canada, they are admissible, but they're still very controversial because legal experts believe that they can often lead to uh, coerced or false confessions. Often, these stings can span more than 150 scenarios, but Jason confesses after only 14. With Jason's confession, all that's left is to get Josh. On July 19th, 2014, Josh agrees to meet with Jason and the undercover officer in a mall parking lot just outside of Calgary. Upon meeting, Josh tells them everything he knows about the night of the fire. According to Josh, Jason got caught forging his father's signature on checks for the farm's account and was cut out of everything involved with the farm. All I know is that in discussions with him and other people we've talked to during the investigation was that his dad was certainly the controller of the money for the family and that uh, Jason got what he asked for in most cases you know, it would have been an insecure position, I guess, to be in, in a man in your 30s when, uh, you know, you're still relying on your dad for 100 bucks here and 100 bucks there to fix your car or fix your truck or whatever. Josh even draws a map of the Klaus family home so that he could explain exactly what he did on the night of the fire. And then hands over the lighter he used to start it. Between Jason and Josh, the details of the night emerge. 
Josh was, in fact, the person that he met at the bar that night, uh, that they went their separate ways from the bar, but met up a very short time later. They meet up, and Jason drives Josh to the farm. Josh then walks in the fresh tire prints to avoid making footprints in the snow. The murders took place. The dog was shot. The gasoline, aviation fuel, actually, was spread throughout the house. And uh, that, Josh lit the fire, got in the truck, went to the river, that Jason met him there, and uh, drove him back to town. When Josh leaves the scene, he tries to drive the truck in the exact tire prints he walked through earlier to hide his footprints even more. Jason and Josh then met at the river so they could abandon Gordon's truck, and Jason could drive Josh back to town. Finally, Josh claims that the way he beat the polygraph test was just by clenching his butt cheeks. Alongside Jason and Josh's confessions, the RCMP gather evidence against the pair. Despite admitting to planning the crime to authorities, Jason has the gall to ask if the murder charges against him will be dropped, since he wasn't at the scene when the crimes take place. Officers are incredulous, and the courts seemingly answer the question for him. The two stand trial in the fall of 2017. But some questions still remain, like why did Jason come up with the story about the spirits in the first place? Well, I think it's natural for a person to have to tell what they've done wrong. Most people can't live with the guilt inside them as to what they have ever done or participated in, and at some point in time, have to release that information. I believe in this case, he released it by using his mother, sister, and aunt as that funnel of information. He used that as the, you know, the line between um, reality and and his involvement in that in that action. Even with Jason and Josh in prison, the community will never be the same without the classes. I think the initial shock is tremendous. You know, you the shock wave I think is greater than you know you would get in a in a larger city, depending it would probably not spread so far in the big city. And, uh, but I think regardless of where you are, the, sh the, the reality is there that, that this can happen and um, that people's mental health and their ability to make proper decisions um, can be anywhere. But it's only because of the community itself that justice is found. The way those close to the family aided by getting Jason caught is immeasurable. If not for the actions of those close to the family, like Brady Flett, the truth may never have come out. I'm sure all those people miss him and, uh, and have good things to say about him and the whole family. You know, they've been there for many years, so they were part of that community. <laughs>